Hey everyone, I'm Mark Goddard, MMA referee, and I'm here to answer some questions, your questions, with Laura Sanko. And when the action begins, a referee in charge of the octagon, Mark Goddard. Why do MMA referees wear gloves? Um, <clears throat> it's really a hygiene thing, to be honest. You know, fighters, bodily fluids, mainly blood, etc. You know, when you go to a dentist, a doctor's, things like that, people that are touching bodies, it's it's generally, you know, it, it's cleanliness, hygiene and courteous just to wear the gloves. And then, you know, it looks pretty cool too. Don't do that. Don't do that, please. please. Who pays UFC referees? Commissions. Uh, depending on where we are in the world. Um, you know, because not every country you go to, uh, is there a commission? And in general, the same as boxing, you know, even though there is a commission, the people are the intermediaries, that's what they, so the promotion, whether it be boxing, MMA, whoever, they will pay a set fee towards the commission, which in turn pays for all the services from the commission, including officials. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Mark Goddard has called a stop to this contest. How are UFC referees chosen? Again, it's a mixture of where the fights take place in the world. Uh, when I talk about commissions, that's pretty much, by and large, the, the United States. You know, that's uh, that's how it operates over there. So if the UFC reserve a date in New York or Las Vegas or whichever, Florida, whichever state it may be, and then the commission will be the intermediaries who can go out and contact the uh, officials directly. Uh, a lot of the times, and for other promotions, you'll see me work all over the world. In other countries, you know, north, south, east and west, there is no commission. So you're directly dealing on a one-to-one -one with uh, an advisor or somebody who works with booking people within the promotions. But again, the confidence comes from the hard work, from the ability. Why do MMA referees pat down fighters at the checkpoint? It's just, uh, it, you're basically... Well, number one, you're, you're checking that they're free of any foreign substance. You know, the, the, there's no liniment oils or grease on them. You know, you'll see us uh, perform a rub down of the chest, the shoulders, the arms, the legs. Um, and then it's a final check for their safety equipment just to make sure, obviously make sure there's nothing wrong with the gloves that haven't been tampered with, the boxes on, you know, the groin guard, the mouthpiece, etc. It's just a once overall check. Number one, to make sure they're free of foreign substance. And number two, that they're wearing everything that they should be and not wearing things they shouldn't be. How does one become an MMA referee? <laughs> um, well, I mean, like, like any like any industry or job or vacation, you know, I say to people, probably the most common question i get or one of them for sure and they say how do how do i become an mma referee and number one is to start at the bottom you know look for if you're involved in the sport um and by that i mean a practitioner not necessarily mma because a lot of people say that they go oh do you have to have been a fighter to a foot no absolutely categorically not put that to bed no if you're involved with the sport whether you train wrestling jujitsu muay thai boxing whatever it give you a better understanding, you know, of the practical applications. And then if there is, uh, like I said, if you live in an area or a country that has an athletic commission, contact them, look for some recognized training uh, that the likes of myself, Herb or other referees will give out. And then, you know, get your, like, like anything I say, people go to, I explain this on the seminars with refs and judges, people go to a university for what, three, four, maybe five years when they come out of that university, hopefully with their qualification or degree, they don't jump straight in at the top. It's exactly the same when it comes to MMA officiating. You can't, there's, there's two things you can't bypass and it's time and experience and they're both directly inherent of each other. So I say to people, get out amongst it, contact your local shows, ask to be a volunteer, get behind the scenes, learn the sport, learn as much as you can and then slowly but surely that, you know, the more you apply the self, the more you go out there. People think that we just sat down and that what one day the phone rang. It wasn't like that. 20 years ago when I began refing, I was doing all those things and working shows for free and stuff like that. You've just got to have a realistic view on it and, and take your time for sure. Oof. Look at that. 
and there's nothing else to be said. Well, it's hard to watch Volk here digest this defeat yeah. shortly thereafter. Nice job by Mark Goddard on the stoppage, but Islam Akashev reigns supreme. Do MMA referees know how to fight? I don't know about all of them, but some, <laughs> but most of the guys, you know, like I said, I had a background in MMA and obviously I'm still a martial artist, you know, more than half my life. And it's always stood me in good stead. Pretty much all the, the referees that I know at the top at least still train in one or more facet, whether it be jujitsu, mostly jujitsu, but I'll still train. I'll still spar very occasionally. I'm still training uh, 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 jujitsu every week. I still teach jujitsu every week, obviously wrestling for MMA, etc. So most of the, like, it goes back to what I was saying before. If you are involved in, same as a judge, you know, if you're involved in one or more of the facets of MMA, even as a recreational practitioner, you're going to have a far better understanding. When it comes down to fighting, that's a different story altogether. I can attest to the fact that Mark is quite the bull in the training room. We had one training day together. Never again. I tapped out. I tapped out. No, I want, I want no, no more. Lightweight of advantage. <laughs> Slight. All against the champion, Alexander Volkanovsky. Are UFC referees doctors? No, I don't know any referee that's a, I don't know any referee that's actually a certified or qualified doctor. Um, that's why you'll have specialists for that, you know, referees are referees, judges are judges, doctors are doctors. I have undergone basic first aid training in various, even in my previous role and, and, and working commercially, but uh, by and large, the medical practitioners and specialists you will see at an event are just that, and they're there for that specific reason. They're the experts in that field. Oh. How do MMA referees know when to stop a fight? Famous question, you know, how long is a piece of string? Look, obviously there's, there's levels to this, you know, um, kind of, you know, am I going to treat a first-time amateur the same as a professional fighter? No. Am I going to teach? Am I going to? Um, I'll approach it the same, but obviously, common sense tells you I'm not going to let the uh, a first-time pro or a first-time amateur get into as deep a water as as I would a seasoned professional fighting for potentially a world championship fight. Despite what people may say, despite what the internet thinks. And it's like this. Look, I kind of use the analogy. I'll give you two analogies that hopefully will make sense. When when a fight begins, you know, like you imagine that they're in the water, okay? And I'm a lifeguard alongside them. And you know they're going to go out into various depths of water. You know, it's going to get deep. It's going to, they may go under the water. They may come back up. I'm there right alongside them, you know? you know how deep that water is going to get at points. And again, it comes back to the fight, the level it may be, et cetera. And sometimes you'll see a fighter go underwater, the head will go under maybe several times. And there's a belief in there that you think that they've gone under the water for the last time. And it's your job to get them out. And it's as simple as that. There's also another methodology that I, might, I may employ. It's the traffic light system. You know, I've explained this before in previous in fact, what, I was very humbled because when I explained this, there, there's a very famous boxing ref from California called Jack Reese. Amazing guy. World-class boxing referee and amazing guy. And he grabbed me at last year's ABC. And he said, hey, Mark, he said, I listened to this analogy you said about the traffic lights. And he said, I think it's amazing. I've never heard anything like it. And he uses it. But anyway, so the analogy is this. Look, a fight begins. It's a green light, you know. It could be competitive. It's going back and forth and, and things happen. One fighter may then get uh, an advantage over another, maybe hurt him, stumble him, knock him down. The light turns amber. So I'm standing there watching these lights. The light may turn to red then. You know, if I think that the fight has gone to a certain point where the fighter can't avail himself or can't get himself out, I'm going to have to take them out of that fight and do my job and... Listen, it's it's probably, it's the, you know, it, it's one of the biggest unforgiving parts of the sport, you know, because it's if a fighter gets submitted, it's over, it's clear. If a fighter gets clean, knocked out, it's over, it's clear. 
it's on that middle ground of the of the TKO, the technical knockout, where you as the referee are making the decision based on the level, the safety, and the awareness of that fighter. It's not an exact science. It can't be an exact science. But please trust in the in the person who's making that call with nothing other than the best of intentions and experience at heart. I hope that makes sense. A referee in charge of the octagon, Mark Goddard. The internet would like to know what is Mark Goddard's salary? <laughs> I can answer that very clearly. Not what Google says, believe me. <laughs> It's not That's what Google says. If only it was what Google says. Oh, man, I thought the referee was going to stop it. Oh, he is. That's, That's it. it. Get him a second belt. Talk to me about the secondary ref, what his or her role is. Um, you're talking about the review official, right? Yes. Um, yeah, that's somebody that you know, you'll see is on the broadcast. The, the referee in the cage remains the sole arbiter. He is the one with the final decision. Our job, obviously, look, it's 2024. Technology is a good thing. You look at other top line sports, they've got officials and cameras everywhere. It's only quite recently that we've started to employ it within MMA and rightly so, because we are human beings. We can only be on one side at one time. We can't see through objects. We can't see through people and things happen, as you know, in MMA at a rapid pace. Something could happen that we that we miss, could be an eye perk, could be a groin shot, could be anything. So in essence, the, the job of the review official is just that. They'll see that we're sat there in front of the screen. We've got a little box of tricks that can pause the live camera. It can go back 10 seconds, go forward 10, frame by frame. It's a wonderful bit of kit they've got cage side. Uh, and really, yes, if the, if the review official sees something egregious, you may have saw it last year at one point. It's only one time it's happened. You saw an amber light come on. Um, mm -hmm. I think during the fight with, it could have been um, Alexa Grasso and Shevchenko, if I'm not mistaken. I wasn't the ref. I wasn't there, I don't think. But the, the signification of the amber light tells you that something's happened and the referee may not have seen it. So we have the ability to call at any time um, a replay uh, just to make sure that was something that we hadn't missed. And that's the job of the, the review official. Sometimes you'll see on the on the broadcast or the pay-per-views in between rounds, we'll walk over to the commission table mm -hmm. and on that commission table, myself, Herb, Herzog, whoever it may be, we're sat there looking at the review as the referees in the cage. They can come to us at the end of each round. Like I said, it's quite an extreme set of circumstances to put on an amber light. But if it happens, that ability is there for us. Generally, the you know, if something was called if the referee saw something, he has the ability, like I said, to call time, utilize the anytime replay, have a brief conversation with a review official as well. Anything that makes him or makes that referee in a better place to make their final decision. Like I said, it's a fast paced sport. It's 2024. We have all this technology of cameras everywhere. So we want to use it, especially in a combat sport where making sure the right person walks away with that win is of paramount importance. Is that specific to the UFC and to Nevada or not, is it? Sorry. No, I specific, said. Yeah, not specific to Nevada. Some jurisdictions, some um, commissions in the US still do not employ the anytime replay. What they do is go by the old rule, which meant it had to be a fight ending foul. Um there is more and more commissions now working with the anytime replay because the technology is there, you know, and mostly when the UFC go to other countries, foreign territories, they will just default to what Nevada are doing. Um, and Nevada, as you know, have any time, we have the ability for anytime replay. And like I said, look, it's about making sure we get the fairest, safest possible um, ending to a fight should we need it. We've got all that technology there, you know. We've got the, the 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 review official, sorry, the main arbiter, the official inside, and you've got a review official outside. Why not utilize them to the fullest extent? Alex, away. No coaching. No coaching. Do you study the the fighters? Not really, Laura, because look, like you said. I've been in the sport now 25 years. <laughs> I've seen a lot, and obviously from 
from an official's point of view, um, when it comes to who I'm refereeing, it's not necessarily important to me because, yeah, of course I'm immersed in the sport. I'm watching the sport. We can't turn off. Me and all my friends and the officials, if we're not working fights, we're talking about them or watching them. So, and then in those times, if I'm not there, I'm training. So there you go. Tells you how busy we are with fights. We don't, I don't really look at a fight card. T to me, it doesn't make any odds who I'm turning up to referee. You may see us in certain commissions like, a car, Vegas, namely, where they'll have a commission meeting. So maybe one week, 10 days before there's a world championship fight, the officials are assigned. That's not really the norm. Most places you go there and it's better like that because we just walk in, get our assignments three or four hours before the fight, job done. We've got a nice, you know, blank canvas in our minds. I always say to would-be officials and, and, and officials when we're working, one of the most dangerous things an official can do is be preoccupied with what they think is yeah. going to happen. We don't take that. We take it on face value. It's a blank canvas. Every round is a blank canvas. We don't know what the fighters are going to do. And we just run with it as it, as it, you know, as it plays. So that's what my advice is to, you know, would be fight, uh, would be officials and, and some experienced officials as well. I saw so many people get, a bit preoccupied with, like I said, oh, I'm dealing with this fight and oh, he's got a tendency to do this. And I'm like, well, if he does that, then MMA is a fact-based sport, right? Mm -hmm. We deal with what's happened, not what we think is going to happen or happening. It's in the moment, the same as judges. You watch a round of fighting, every single thing that happens in that round, you report on it. It's past or present tense, not the future. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And as, as it should be. Shows up in the champ bracket would you ever take a point for shoving after a round it would be context driven you know yeah. like you know a sh like a little you know handbags at dawn kind of thing or but a, you know somebody coming in after the <laughs> somebody coming in after that's a very british saying this is incredibly <laughs> british <laughs> yeah um handbags at dawn God, where was i now what were we talking about we're talking about shoving after oh, yeah, shoving. <laughs> so look it's context driven the referee comes in, there's a little bit of argy, but, you know, emotions run high in a fight. That's different. If you break them up and then somebody's ch charging across the cage and send you flying into the canvas or flying onto the mat, that's a different thing altogether. You know, not all fouls are equal. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and by that definition, all consequences shouldn't be equal either. We take it on face value. How did it play out? How forceful was it? Was it damaging, et cetera, et cetera? Was it repetitive? And then we'll deal with it. Big spots against the sports best. Stop. Oh, Stop. oh, another poke. Stop. Oh, it was a uh, poke in the eye. Yeah. There's always a lot of discussion around DQ versus no contest. And a lot of that comes down to intentional versus unintentional fouls. I mean, look, disqualifications are there. It's in the rules. It's necessary, unfortunately. I have DQ'd people before in the past. Very few and far between. Because what most people don't realize is that they will see an illegal action during a fight, a foul. And yes, it was a foul, a kick to the grounded fighter, a knee to a grounded fighter, etc. They will see that action. Oh my God, it was an illegal strike to there. But that's not our job. The referee, the, so a very clear instance, you can see, I'm like, okay, it's without deliberation. It's without question they got kneed or kicked in the head. What the referee's job is to do is to see if the referee, uh, sorry, to see if the fighter acted intentionally. Was it, sometimes you can be reckless, but not malicious. Yes. Okay. Like a classic case in point, I drop you with a left hand, you go stumbling backwards. I have to run five meters across the cage to get to you. And then I'll suck a kick you in the face. No argument there. If we're against the fence and we're rattling each other up and down, up and down. You go down, I go down, up. And then I throw an inherent knee to the head and the knee connects flush. There's no question about me meaning to knee you in the head, but wasn't it reasonable? was it reasonable for me to assume I knew you were down? So it's actually the intent on the action, not the weapon of choice, if that makes sense. It's a, it's a rare, I have DQ people in the past. Obviously, it's a rare occurrence, thankfully. But you've got to take into consideration as a referee that sometimes I could be entirely reckless or careless, but I'm not necessarily being malicious.
Mark, thank you so much for the information today. We always appreciate your time and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have you on again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep taking notes, keep uh, adding up my, my questions. We'll have to have you on again. Maybe we'll have some new rules. Anytime, Laura, anytime, reach out. Thank you, Mark. Take care, thank you.